thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Junaid, uh, for uh, first of all for the invitation, and also for the kind uh, uh, opening remarks. Uh, um, I. Uh, I'm so happy that I could uh, give this talk because I have so many good memories from uh, uh, previous days in, in the Emirates and especially Abu Dhabi. So I would like to thank you and Dr. <coughs> Ayman for organizing this and inviting me to talk about oxygen therapy in the, the newborn period. So here are my disclosures and here is an outline of uh, my lecture and as you understand uh, during 30 minutes um, I can't uh, go into details <coughs> in all these uh, issues but I'll touch upon uh, several of these. So for those of you who are um, interested in the field here are some of uh, the most recent articles from, uh, from um, my collaborators and myself uh, and I think you can find uh, much of what I'm saying there. Uh, if I may draw your attention to this um, <coughs> uh, issue of seminars in fetal and neonatal medicine, uh, the whole April issue is uh, dedicated to oxygenation of the newborn. So we try to set up uh, the goals of oxygen therapy and I think there are four goals, at least four goals. And, and the first, of course, the most important is to provide sufficient oxygen to the tissues and avoid anaerobic metabolism. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, to prevent hypoxic uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction. And uh, also, of course, uh, to promote brain and somatic growth. And I guess every neonatologist also know that we have to minimize the adverse effects of oxygen because oxygen is uh, not only critical to life, all of you know that uh, too much oxygen in the, the newborn uh, can cause uh, oxidative stress, uh, contributing to lung injury and disease as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, retinopathy or prematurity, brain damage or impaired brain development, and damage to a number of other organs as the heart and kidney. Now, just a very quick uh, <coughs> uh, biochemistry, biochemical update. As you know, this is the, from the mitochondria. And as you know, in the, in the mitochondrial membrane, you have the electron transport system. Oxidative phosphorylation finds place here. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, what happens is that when the electrons are moving from one of the complex to the other, protons are uh, pumped across uh, the membrane and uh, generating a, a gradient. So here at the, the fifth complex, the, um, this process is reversed. So electrons are accepted by oxygen. So water is generated and then ATP is produced. Now some of these electrons they leak out and uh, react with oxygen and generate uh, reactive oxygen species which can be neutralized by um, antioxidants and antioxidant enzymes. However when we give oxygen more electrons leak out and more reactive oxygen species are generated. In addition less ATP is generated. So this was very, very a quick course about uh, hyperoxia. Now, <clears throat> many years ago now, it's more than 30 years actually, I uh, suggested that maybe there is an oxygen radical disease of neonatology. And the idea was that oxygen radicals uh, may attack a number of organs, perhaps at the same time, of the newborn and I, at that time I was mainly interested in one oxygen radical uh, generating system, the hypersantin santin oxygen system. Today we know that free radicals and oxidative stress is generated by a number of uh, sources uh, mentioned here <clears throat> and of course inflammation is very important uh, in this um, uh, process. <clears throat> 
So the idea was that free radicals um, attack different organs and may contribute to interventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia, retinopathy of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, PDA, neck, and, and so forth. Well, um, I think there is evidence that oxidative stress at least is uh, <clears throat> associated with uh, all these uh, conditions. But uh, the last uh, 30 years or so, I've been mostly occupied with this uh, question. How much, how much oxygen should we give to newborn infants in need of resuscitation? And I will, I will uh, summarize uh, the evidences we have, uh, both for term and, and preterm infants. Now, in 1953, Virginia Apgar proposed her APCA score. And um, if you look at her original uh, paper, uh, you see that 20% of these babies, they received oxygen uh, by some method. Uh, so they were using a lot of oxygen, um, more or less routinely, I would guess, to uh, newborns, newborn babies at that time. So <clears throat> in order to achieve a high APCA score of 9 or 10, uh, a newborn baby has to be pink, as you all know, but at the age of one minute or two minutes, there's only one way to make a newborn baby pink, and that is uh, to give uh, oxygen. And this is what happened. A lot of oxygen was given to, to newborn babies, uh, and many of them did not need a supplemental oxygen. If you look at uh, the normal transition, we know that the fetus is in a hypoxemic condition, a low PO2, saturations between 50 and 65 percent. And during the normal transition, the pulmonary hypertension resolves and there is a gradual improvement in oxygen saturations um, demonstrated here. So cyanosis is normal during fetal life and for the first few minutes after birth. So that's the reason I, I question whether it's, it's really possible to, to have a, an APCA score of 9 or 10, at least at five, one minute, maybe also at five minutes. So if we look at how the oxygen saturation develops in normal babies, uh, the first 10, 15 minutes after birth, you see that <coughs> if we look at the <coughs> upper curve here, uh, the preductal saturation levels, you see that at even at two minutes, two minutes, the mean saturation is just a little bit above 70 with a wide variation. And even at five minutes, uh, many of these babies do not have a saturation above uh, uh, our 80. So what happens if you resuscitate with 100% oxygen? This is from um, a study in newborn lambs is from Richard Linner in Sweden. So what they did was that they <clears throat> clamped the cord of these newborn lambs and after approximately 10 minutes uh, the animals were randomized to be resuscitated with uh, either room air, the blue line, <clears throat> or 100% oxen, the red line here. And you see that if you resuscitate with 100% oxen you get this enormous PO2 peak, uh, very high. Uh, by contrast, if you resuscitate with air, you get this more slow physiological um, adaptation here with the uh, physiological PO2 after a few minutes. So if, um, <clears throat> if we go to the world map of, of newborn uh, resuscitation, it looked like this before 1998. Uh, all um, guidelines recommended to use 100% oxygen for newborn resuscitation. What happened in uh, 1998 was that the so-called RESER2 study uh, was published uh, where we had um, randomized 600 newborns uh, who needed resuscitation at birth to either air or 100% oxygen. And we were able to show that, um, yes, uh, those who received uh, air did as well as uh, those with 100% oxygen. So in the old days, that is before 1998, 
provided the uh, oxygen was at hand, 100% oxygen was given. And if oxygen was not at hand, in many places no uh, ventilation was even tried. So these babies just died. And those who were ventilated, they had this enormous PO2 peak, as I've shown here. Now, <clears throat> many people um, had uh, objections to the idea that we should resuscitate uh, newborn, and I'm talking about term babies now, uh, with the air. So the two main objections was that, first, that when you lack oxygen, uh, supplementary oxygen is needed. And that is, of course, correct, um, but uh, perhaps you shouldn't give more than you need. And then the second comment or objection I got at, I think, almost every meeting where I, I talked about this was that you have to give oxygen in order to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. And that is true. Abram Rudolph uh, in San Francisco showed already in 1966 how pulmonary vascular resistance decreases with increasing PO2. This is in newborn calves. And what you see here is that when you reach a PO2 around 40, 45 millimeter mercury, you don't get a further decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you increase the PO2 to very high levels, it seems to, pulmonary vascular resistance seems to even increase. So above a certain level, you don't need to increase the PO2. Um, in order to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. And you find exactly the same pattern for pulmonary arterial mean pressure. So um, when we finished uh, the RESET 2 study, there were several other studies, uh, other groups who, who um, carried out similar studies. Um, so here is from a meta-analysis we um, published in 2008, the first uh, meta-analysis was uh, a Cochrane review published by Peter Davis and his group in 2004. And we basically found the same, but here we have included more patients, more than 2,000 patients and uh, totally 10 studies. And what we found was that there was a decrease in mortality of 30% if you resuscitate with air compared with 100% oxygen. So, the world map started to change uh, relatively slowly. The first country which uh, changed from oxygen to air was Canada in 2006. A few months later, uh, Australia followed, uh, changing their guidelines, and then Sweden, Finland, UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Russia uh, quickly changed. Many countries said we will do something in between. And some countries were very resistant, as for instance, US, where they didn't want to change from 100% at that time. So in this, um, in this period, some babies who were resuscitated got this very high PO2 peak shown down here, and then some got the more physiological approach. However, in uh, 2010, 10 days ago, 10 years ago, yesterday, ILCOR came out with new recommendations and they said that in term infants receiving recitation at birth with positive pressure ventilation, it is best to begin with air rather than 100% oxygen. So then the world map changed uh, to something like this. All the guidelines changed um, and recommended to start with air and we got this more physiological approach uh, with a slow PO2. An increase. So we try to illustrate uh, <clears throat> what happens when you resuscitate with air or 100% oxygen. So if you resuscitate with air, you get this more slow, uh, slower uh, normalization of PO2 up to physiological levels. Some free radicals are generated. However, when you resuscitate with 100% oxygen, you get this, you get this uh, enormous PO2 peak and also a wave of free radicals. And, and this affects the, the child with cerebral vasoconstriction, brain inflammation, 
pulmonary vascular reactivity increases, as I mentioned already, and it's also been shown that you get myocardial uh, damage and acute renal injury. And hyperoxia, the first minutes after birth, is also associated with childhood leukemia. Now, a year ago, a new meta-analysis uh, came out from the ILCOR group by Wellsford and co-workers, but it basically analyzed the same uh, data as, as we had, uh, but they had a little bit fewer patients than we had in our meta-analysis, but they found basically the same as we did uh, 11 years earlier. There is approximately 30% reduction in mortality if you resuscitate with air compared with 100% oxygen. And these uh, authors uh, stated that there will unlikely be any further studies on this topic, and that might be true, but we know that uh, science um, moves on and it might be that uh, new studies could be needed in order to kind of tease out if there's any groups or subgroups who, who or even among term and near-term babies who would need extra oxygen during resuscitation. But in general now for term babies, uh, we recommend that uh, resuscitation should be started with, with air. What about preterm infants? That's a little bit more complicated. And the reason for that is that, as you all know, the preterm baby is different. And I will not go into detail, but just uh, point out that preterm babies, they react differently to hypoxia. They go directly into bradycardia often, which may contribute to uh, interventricular hemorrhage. And they don't tolerate hyperoxia as well as term babies because they have a lower defense against oxidative stress. And we know that uh, their um, uh, uh, thoracic cage is different. Uh, than term babies, it's softer, muscles are weaker, and they lack surfactant. Uh, so there, there are many uh, differences between term and, near, uh, and uh, uh, premature babies. In 2010, <coughs> Ilkor stated regarding <coughs> preterm babies, uh, because many preterm babies less than 32 weeks uh, will not reach target saturations in air. Blended oxygen and air may be given judiciously and ideally guided by pulse oximetry. So you see here that uh, ILCOR doesn't say anything about which FiO2 you should start with and which saturation targets you should aim at. Five years later, Ilkor was more specific uh, regarding preterm babies, and they, they, they wrote then, we, we recommend against initiating resuscitation of preterm newborns less than 35 weeks of gestation with high supplementary oxygen concentrations. And we recommend initiating resuscitation with a low oxygen concentration, that's 21 to 30% of oxygen. I just also want to show you the European uh, recommendations um, um, published a year ago. Oxygen should be controlled by using a blender and initial FiO2 of 30% is appropriate for babies less than 28 weeks gestation and 21 to 30% for those between 28 and 31 weeks. And adjustments guided by pulse of Symmetry. Now let's look at the, the evidence for these uh, recommendations. So the first question is, of course, how should we stabilize or oxygenate very small babies? This is from um, data from a study published from Max Ventus group uh, more than 10 years ago, babies less than 29 weeks. They were randomized in the delivery room to receive 90% or 30% oxygen provided they needed positive pressure ventilation. And you see here that after three or four minutes, there's no difference in FiO2 because uh, FiO2 was adjusted according to the saturation and heart rate. There's no difference in, in heart rate. 
and I surprisingly there was no difference in in saturation uh, either uh, between these groups. Now three years ago we published a so-called torpedo trial which is I think the largest study to date um, to study this um, this issue and in this um, trial infants less than 32 weeks were randomized in the delivery room to air or 100% oxen if they needed the post depression ventilation. Now we didn't find any difference in mortality when we looked at the whole cohort of babies. However, when we did a post hoc analysis uh, and looked at babies less than 28 weeks separately, we found that those who had been started with room air had an almost fourfold increased relative risk for mortality compared to those who received 100% oxygen. Of course, that was very concerning. So um, we carried out several reviews and meta-analysis to try to uh, collect all the, the data which had been um, published at that time. So I will show you a result from one of our most recent uh, meta-analysis where we compared uh, outcome of babies who received a high FiO2 initially, that is 60 to 100 percent oxygen, versus a low FiO2, 21 to 30 percent. So here's the flow diagram. I will not go into details here, but uh, there's approximately eight studies um, included in our analysis. So if you look at uh, mortality first, and these are babies less than 32 weeks, you see there's absolutely no difference in mortality whether you start high or low, red the risk 0.99. And when we look at some uh, secondary outcomes, uh, uh, again, there was not much uh, difference between the groups, but we have to keep in mind that these studies were not powered for the secondary outcomes. So there might be, uh, we might need more patients before we can draw conclusions. There is a tendency the less BPD if you start with a low FO2. Interventricular hemorrhage, there's uh, no difference between the groups. ROP, no difference between the groups. But there is a, again a tendency to more necrotizing anticholitis uh, in the low saturation group. For patent ductus arteriosus, there was absolutely no difference between the groups. Now, after that, we became interested in uh, how the saturation should develop, especially the first five minutes. And the reason for that was that we found in the torpedo trial that those babies who did not reach a saturation of 80% within the first five minutes of life, they had a significantly higher um, incidence of death or disability, was, which was the primary outcome of that study. So you see here that um, adjusted odds ratio um, for the primary outcome, death or disability, is 0.50. It's a 50% reduction, uh, provided the child reaches a saturation of at least 80% within five minutes. And when we did follow-up of these babies and we looked at cognitive score, you see that those who did not reach a saturation of 80% within five minutes had a significantly lower cognitive score, more than five points, which I think is uh, quite substantial. So what we have done is that we have tried to analyze and follow the cohort of more than 700 babies from eight studies. And in this cohort, some babies have been resuscitated with air, some with 30% oxygen, some with 60%, and some with 90 to 100% oxygen. So we looked at different um, gestational ages, and here we have the, the data for those about 29 weeks, between 29 weeks and 32 weeks. And you see how the saturation develops the first 10 minutes of life according to which FiO2 we, uh, which was started out with. Now the shaded area here is the targets recommended by the American Heart Association, and these uh, shaded uh, circles, the uh, targets uh, suggested by the European Resuscitation Council.
Now, none of these are really evidence-based, it's the best guess, um, but still it's interesting to see that all the groups, it, they were above the targets, except for those who were resuscitated with, with air. It took six minutes before they reached the target. For babies um, less than 29 weeks, um, all the groups were under target, except for those who were started out with 90 to 100% oxygen. And you see, it takes uh, approximately seven, eight minutes to reach the target. Now, we don't know if this is good or bad, <clears throat> but it's um, absolute, I think, an, an observation of interest. Now, for those babies who did not reach the saturation of 80% within five minutes, there was a higher mortality. I mentioned already, there's also more severe interventricular hemorrhage, but there's no difference regarding BPD. Now, when you're talking about saturation, oxygen saturation, the first minutes of life, uh, it's uh, more complicated than I mentioned so far. For instance, if a baby is on CPAP, the saturation increases faster than if it's not on CPAP. And there's also a gender difference, uh, sex difference. So girls uh, increase their saturation faster than boys, probably because their lungs are more mature than, than boys. So now the question is, um, what should we do? Should we start with a high FO2 to the smallest babies and tighten it down, or should we start low and tighten it up? Well, this, is, I think, is a very hot uh, uh, question in neonatology these days. And it's not an easy uh, answer to give, because if you look here, uh, and this is from a study by Binder Heschel from Austria um, recently, you see here, here we have the, the saturation uh, for those who reach a saturation of 80% within five minutes, the upper curve, and those who do not, the lower curve. And you see here, there's not a big difference between these groups, at least not at three minutes of age. So it's hard to predict uh, from the beginning which babies will reach the saturation of 80% and, and which will not do that. And if you look at the FIO2 between these uh, two groups, you see that there's absolutely no difference, at least very little. So if you are in the delivery room, you cannot, based on the FIO2, say anything about whether the baby will reach a saturation of 80 or not. So um, some people say that for that reason, we should start high and tighten it down. And an extra argument for that is that it's been shown by Stuart Hooper's group in, uh, in Melbourne that immature infants may need some extra ox oxygen in order to open the glottis. And very recently, um, Decker and co-workers, they published a study where they had randomized babies between 24 and 29 weeks to either 30% oxygen or 100% oxygen. So they found that if you give 100% oxygen, these babies have a higher minute volume, shorter duration of mass ventilation, higher oxygenation at five minutes, shorter duration of hypoxemia, but a higher FIO2 exposure during the first five minutes. But there was no difference in duration of hyperoxemia or oxidative stress markers. So um, these um, authors, they, um, suggests that uh, it's better to start high and titrate down. But see, it's not a big study, only 44 infants. So um, we argued against that. <clears throat> and uh, because we know that uh, supplemental oxygen, even very brief, leads to increased oxidative stress. Uh, others have shown that. It leads to inflammation, genomic changes, reduces DNA repair and cell growth inhibition. And we are, and others have shown that hyperoxia also induces epigenetic changes. We don't know if these are permanent or not. But on the other hand, we know that oxygen may be needed in most immature infants, those are less than 28 weeks. But we think that we should give it as low 
and as brief as possible. So my view is that we should start low, maybe at 30%, maybe at 40%, we don't know, and titrate up according to saturation and the clinical response. So that's the, the last few minutes, a few words about the, the Neoprom study, how we should oxygenate immature babies beyond the delivery room. So the Neoprom trials uh, ask this question, what is the optimal target saturation for preterm neonates that would result in the lowest death or neurodisability rate? And uh, to answer these questions, uh, five studies uh, have been uh, carried out. It was a support trial, the COT trial, and the BOOST trials from UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So in these trials, babies less than 28 weeks were randomized before the age of 24 hours to a low saturation target, 85 to 89%, or a high saturation target, 91 to 95%. So what was found was that in the low saturation target was more necrotizing enterocolitis and there was higher mortality before discharge. On the other hand, in the high saturation targets, there was more ROP in need of treatment, but not more blindness. So this, um, these results, uh, I think, uh, contributed to change in, in guidelines. 2010, for instance, it was... Um, in the European, I think also in the American guidelines, that babies' saturation should be kept between 85 to 93 percent. In 2000 and um, around 15, 17, um, guidelines changed to be uh, to saturation should be kept between 90 to 95 percent, for instance. Here I, have, I looked at uh, the risk difference in some of the outcome measures between the high and low saturation groups. So we see that if um, a variable is above zero here, it means that it favors um, high saturation targets. Here's the p-values. And you see that uh, death is reduced in the high saturation targets, also necrotized enterocolitis. On the other hand, ROP, and also BPD, at least, uh, it depends a little bit about the definition, but it's also increased in the high saturation target. Very recently, um, a long-term follow-up at six years of age uh, came out um, from um, some of these, I think, the support data, where they looked at um, blood pressure. Uh, and fortunately, there was no difference in blood pressure. Um, between the high saturation target babies and the low saturation target babies. So, oxygen targets between 91 to 95% increase ROP in need of therapy, but not severe vision injury. Oxygen targets of oh, 85 to 89% increase mortality and necrotizing anticholitis. And long term follow up does not show any differences between the two arms regarding death, disability, blindness, hearing loss, or blood pressure. But as I mentioned, I don't have time to show those uh, results. Hyperoxia may lead to epigenetic changes in the lung. We don't know if they are transient or long-lasting. So I would just want to, to close very quickly, say a few words about congenital diaphragmatic hernia. As you all know, we, we should try to avoid bag and mask ventilation. So these babies should be intubated quickly and an orogastic tube should be inserted. And we recommend to start uh, recitation with 50% oxygen in these babies. We don't have big material. So this is not very strongly evidence-based, but it's more based on, on clinical experience. Target saturations <clears throat> are recommended to be between 85. <clears throat> and 95%. And if uh, there is a persistent bradycardia or saturation is less than 80% at five minutes, increase FO2. And delayed core clamping is also recommended and avoid a peak inspiratory pressure uh, of about 25 centimeter of water and try to keep the peep uh, pressure low. And finally, just uh, quickly about um, 
uh, primary pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, how should you oxygenate these? Well, it's recommended to keep the saturation um, in the high um, range here. So it's recommended to give 90 to 97% and keep a PO2, uh, preductal PO2 of 55 to 80 millimeter mercury, that's 7.3 to 10.7 kilopascals. Um, so just to um, summarize, uh, I think that uh, today we, to some extent, are able to individualize oxygen therapy of the newborn much more than we did 10 years ago. And every baby got the same 100% oxygen for newborn visitation, for instance. Now for babies above 31 weeks, start with air. <clears throat> Between 28 and 31 weeks start with air or 30% oxygen. Less than 28 weeks start with 30% oxygen. It might be we need more, maybe 40%. We don't know yet. And for all station ages, adjust according to the saturation. And <clears throat> we recommend to start low and tighten it up. <clears throat> but there, of course, uh, are different opinions about that. We need more randomized studies to, to really see what is the significance of, uh, of a saturation above or lower than 80% at five minutes of age. Now in the future, when you're talking about development of saturation, we have to also adjust for gender, CPAP and cord clamping. Beyond delivery room, babies less than 28 weeks, targets of 91 to 95 or 1994, which is the European recommendation, very tight alarm limits because we want to avoid uh, hyperoxemia. For uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernias, start with 50% oxygen and for uh, pulmonary, uh, primary pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, keep the saturation between 90 to 97%. So with this, I will thank you for um, your attention and I would like to thank all my those collaborators.